an untrue version of the truth that's a new one yeah fake news if it looks fake it must be real the government when did they ever hold their hands up to anything anyway i'm still waiting for that day morning dan yeah yeah everybody's trying to say something it's just that nobody can understand any of it <laughs> Yeah, I bet it does. Um, Paul, I noticed that you sent a contact request to that account, that other account of mine, the one that has no contacts on it, so I sent you one on this. I think it means if the truth is not the truth, then it's nothing but not the truth. Exactly. Politicians and their weapons of mass distraction. Oh, it's a, a satellite plane. Um, and the, the wording on it basically all you need is like eight of those planes to give full land coverage uh, signals uh, yeah I guess it's whatever they decide appropriate you know for whatever they want to be able to utilize the service and I guess they choose what does oh no I'm not saying that man I'm not saying it handles all of the communications we've got towers for that haven't we and cables but I would suggest that the military certainly need full coverage at least for them i suppose what it's kind of highlighting there is um if they're really where satellites orbiting the planet quote planet then they wouldn't need those planes because it would already be taken care of wouldn't it on various frequencies by satellites okay so basically they're to be used for these times when we can't connect to satellites is that what you're saying yeah Pen does the same thing as a pencil, they're both right, right? This has the potential to be one of those conversations that can go in the wrong direction, so should we continue? <laughs> I appreciate it, there's always alternative explanations for things, you know. Um, I don't think there's an alternative explanation as to why all the dishes in my neighbourhood are pointing towards the high-rise building with the tower on it, like, but, you know, we can entertain the idea of satellites all the same. No, it's just one of one of um, many things that could be up there in our atmosphere, in our ether, you know, doing the repeater thing. Yeah, from what I understand, they're not manned. Um, whether they can be manned or not, I'm guessing they could be manned. I don't know, really. It, it depends on what constitutes a person's belief. For the most part, people who say that they believe in satellites claim to see them with their eye. Well, the actual logistics of that kind of thing and its size and its distance away um, and the fact that they're not self-illuminated proves that it's a fallacy, you know. So we can all go down our mental routes, but whether they have any real substance to them or not is up for speculation, isn't it? I didn't say that they get the TV from those, Dan. Um, it's possible that those people who claim to be using satellite phones get the signals from that. Um, I think I just said, you know, that the, the dishes um, in my neighbourhood are pointing towards a tower, you know, so that's where your TV would come from. Um, I've also made observations over a river and I've noted that um, domestic properties with dishes on the sides have pointed their, their dishes across a, a river. So it seems that distance isn't really a problem for these signals. There could be catching a signal from many, many miles away, because let's face it, we're all expected to believe that signals were caught from 238,000 miles away from the surface of the moon. So given that this technology exists, that these signals can traverse long distances, then they could also traverse long distances across land, which is one of the arguments that some people put forward. People, for instance, who maybe live in Australia will say, well, there's no towers where I'm getting my signal and I drive for hours and hours and days or whatever. But if these signals can be sent over such distances as 238,000 miles, then I don't see why on a flat plane it would be such a problem to send those signals across vast areas of land. Mm, feasibly, quite possibly, yeah. Um, I've come to understand, though, that the signals coming from the towers, because like uh, objects tend to get in the way sometimes I've concluded that the signals must act a little bit like water do you know the way water finds its way around an object because the observations that I've made about you know the directions that these some of these 
dishes are pointed. Um, see, they're not all the same. It depends whether there's something in front of it or not. But yeah, um, bouncing signals off the troposphere, this is all quite feasible, you know. Again, eliminating the idea that we need a satellite. Um, signals that were sent in 1918 from the UK to Australia, no satellites existed. It was Arthur C. Clarke, wasn't it, who came out with the idea, and he was a science fiction writer. And it was shortly after he came out with that idea that all of a sudden, hey, look, we have these things. Yeah, I had a very uh, similar kind of experience when I had my over-the-air internet installed. And I observed that he pointed the tiny dish towards the tower. And I asked him the question. I said, are you pointing that towards that tower there? And he openly admitted that he was pointing it towards the tower. Um, I was going to say something else then. Darn it. That was it, yeah. Um, you see, all of the things that are dubious in support of these technologies, like, for instance, the moon and the moon landings or that that thing that they called Galileo that they said went off into space a million miles away or wherever, near Venus or wherever they say it went, all mysteriously followed by camera crews in order to take pictures of these things in space. It's like, you know, who was it that was... was um, filming the moon landing and who is it that's taking the picture well it's not a picture it's not a photograph is it it's clearly cgi but we're expected to believe these things when you go around a neighborhood dan and you observe the direction that these um, dishes are pointing and obviously those angles change when you circumvent your neighborhood then it's it becomes a situation a bit like the crepuscular rays of the sun you know when the sun shines through those clouds and they come down at a triangular angle well all you need to do is follow the angle isn't it to find where the pinpoint is where it's all coming from um hence the suggestion that we have a local sun well the same sort of principle with the the dishes there if they're all pointing towards the same the same antenna and those dishes are all spread out like a triangle where the antenna would be the, the peak of the triangle then it's it's a bit conclusive really of course but i'm just talking about natural observation when you see uh, a dish pointed in a general direction or in a specific direction towards a tower and then you have one where an object comes in between or two ob two objects come in between right and let's say for instance it's offset compared to the other one that's pointing directly at the tower so these two objects that are getting in the way there is a gap between the objects and it appears that the the dish is pointing more towards the gap between the two objects so that it can receive the signal which suggests to me that the signal is coming more like in a, a wave motion that can kind of act like water acts you know it can go around some objects to get through those gaps so that the dish can receive the signal this is just natural observation that i'm making here i'm not trying to invent a wild theory off of the back of it or pointing out anything that i'm not witnessing you know so i i have i have to conclude i'm not a telecommunications expert no but nor can any of these telecommunications experts actually see the signals in the atmosphere you know they're told one thing about signals in the atmosphere they'll do their own calculations they'll see what seems to fit or not but the fact remains is we can't see them with our eyes of course i mean as long as you are utilizing your device and it is receiving a signal you don't really even need faith to you know to imagine the idea that it is receiving a signal do you but that's i guess that's a sad issue exactly it's just a, a software program on on a device that you're looking at so here's some food for thought and done um the service that i received is the same as the service that my, my next door neighbor received right although when i made the phone call to this company they didn't say oh yeah we can see that you can receive that signal because your next door neighbor can receive that signal well let's face it if the signal was coming from um something orbit in the planet it should just re receive it the way the next door neighbor receives it but no they have to come and survey the area so they have to make sure that there isn't something getting in the way of that signal and let's face it whatever would be getting in the way of that si signal would be down here on the ground it wouldn't be floating in the atmosphere so you know um we have to use some critical thinking here uh, these the people who are of the opinion that the satellite signals are coming from 
something orbiting the planet. How would that fit in? Yeah, but here's the thing, right? In all of these scenarios, I'm going to draw you a little picture here. In all of these scenarios, this is seemingly what we're expected to believe is happening, right? <laughs> so we're expected to believe that our geostationary satellite is somewhere across the plane horizontally, pretty much, right? Because we're having these issues with buildings getting in the way and signals not really working, right? So just take a look at this picture, right? So we're expected to believe that our geostationary satellite is somewhere in that direction. But where you, where you look at the top of this picture, where the big question mark is, I want to know why our geostationary satellite isn't in that position. So take a look at that picture, Dan. It seems if you look at the dishes, right, all of the signals are coming pretty much across the plane, barring a very small tweak of the angle there, right? And that's because the towers are usually on top, top of things, right? So why would we go to the pains of traversing the longest distances, right? Because if you think about it, if it was a planet, you would be going across the top of the planet rather than going directly above to catch the nearest satellite. And they're supposed to be literally tens of thousands of satellites, right? So why would we, in all observations, pick the satellite that is across the plane rather than picking the one that was more or less directly above our heads, or at least on a, a more favorable angle than the one that allows for objects to get in the way? Yeah, essentially, if these things are geostationary and they're allegedly moving with the rotation of the Earth, then they're in a fixed location. And given that they're supposed to be literally tens of thousands of these things, it seems that all observations show that the railway is pointing towards the one that's furthest away and has um, the maximum amount of interference, you know, meaning objects getting in between buildings and things. Well, maybe the Chinese are right. Maybe we have got floating cities in the sky and that gets in the way. Yeah, but to defer to other people's thinking is to allow for brainwashing, isn't it? Do you know what I mean? We should think for ourselves. So somewhere there should be um, some dishes that are pretty much pointing directly up, right? Because it would make sense that someone somewhere would utilise the closest satellite, right? Yeah, but what, what we're saying here is observations show that they're always pointing right across the plane pretty much there's we can't view any of these dishes going directly up or even on a more conducive angle to a closer satellite than than the ones that are always seem to be pointing as far away as they possibly can you know i mean surely with all of these satellites we would find ourselves in a situation where those dishes somewhere would be pretty much pointing up to the nearest satellite for the strongest signal you know uh, and it also wouldn't explain why there are none pointing directly up well we could always come up with an excuse you know because that's what they do that's what they're best at one of the excuses could be well, the people in the U.S. don't have contracts for the satellites directly above the U.S. They only have contracts for the satellites that are somewhere, you know, hovering around a different country. We can always come up with an excuse. Whether it's actually truth or not is a whole different ballgame. You know, just because somebody says a thing, just because somebody works for a company and, and has qualifications of this or that, and if the company is a quote unquote globally recognized company, it still doesn't mean that they're telling the truth. You know, you can have a thousand people lined up to offer you um, words out of the mouth or notations on paper, but it still doesn't mean they're telling the truth. Yeah, exactly. But given the yeah, ISS used to fly on the top of a good one, but given that we can't see any of these signals, you know, they can feasibly and do come from for the most part, towers on the land. And you can't verify the difference just because you think you've got this tracking system and you trust the integrity of the people who provided you with this tracking system. And you may even be subscribing to it. And you may even think that you've got a contract because you're paying money for this service. It still doesn't mean that they're telling you the truth.
there's a fatal flaw with what you just said there because people claim to see these things at night and the sun is at the alleged other side of the planet so they're not going to be able to catch sunlight then somebody could probably come forward with the claim oh well but they're catching the light from the street lights and from the cities and things like that okay has anybody ever witnessed one of these things above the desert be more inclined to believe that in the true reality of the flat earth plane where the sun does not set but it has actually just gone out of perspective um but then i guess you would be having to look at which side of this object was catching light which side wasn't and the, let's face it these things are way too small at the alleged distances that they're supposed to be at to even make that observation well there are the the means and the ways as you put it to track these things but what's in dispute here is whether these things are actually orbiting a globe or are just up there in the ether you know and you people like like Alex who likes to come into this channel and quote things like the speed of light based off of calculations of things at certain distances that we're told that those are the actual distances so it appears that your calculations are correct but if those things are not the actual distances then your calculations are incorrect so nobody's denying that there are satellites in the ether you know sending signals down which you can track what what's being denied here is that these satellites are actually orbiting a planet because we don't live on a planet allegedly although i don't know anybody who's clever enough to, or i've never seen a piece of machinery or watched an experiment that clearly to my mind would show yes we are we are tracking the speed of light i mean my observations say that light is instantaneous you know but there is a claim that it travels at 186,000 miles per second <laughs> how you would even calibrate your equipment to track that is beyond me but we're told they do and we're told the equipment exists and we're shown results and we just have to take it on faith that the, those results are correct and we're told that we have equipment that can do these things you know but just because somebody can produce a piece of electronic kit that registers something on it that in itself isn't proof that we can measure 186,000 miles essentially and if you're attempting to do it on a small scale then it's a small scale of a large scale you would first have to establish the large scale in order to know what the small scale represented representation was you know we can't measure 186,000 miles how many times is that seven and a half times around the alleged globe I ain't seen that experiment the thing is Dan we can easily measure one hour and we can easily measure 60 miles and we can observe those two things um, without speculating about it, you know. It seems to me that small-scale um, experimentation is accepted when it's convenient, but it's not accepted when it's inconvenient. And by that, I mean when we look at the alleged shape of Earth, the alleged circumference of Earth, that is something that in miles, over hours, you know, just in miles, we can observe. We can calculate because it's within our grasp. But 186,000 miles is not within our grasp. So I would say that, that the people who are making the claim that they can measure something over such distance are just blagging it. Well, basic school science experiments like Pythagorean theorem and spherical trigonometry tells us that we should experience curvature on, on a globe, you know? But all, in those small scales, meaning tens of miles that we can actually witness, with observation over distance we don't experience any of those things so we have what do we have here we have cognitive dissonance going on as if to suggest that we can do small scale experiments and they are valid however when we do those same small scale experiments over distance of the shape of the earth all of a sudden they become invalid people refuse to accept those kinds of small scale experimentation that we can actually observe you know so you'd see um, objects at distance recede when you move far enough away from them and I'm not talking about ships over the horizon because they've been debunked a million times right you just you just get a telescope but I'm talking landmarks and mountains um, obviously atmospheric contamination comes into play perspective comes into play but at the alleged distances and the alleged formula for the curvature of earth we are seeing things that should be over the curve meaning like skylines and things like the black pool tower from Morecambe you know we are witnessing those things
course. And we do have perspective and we have contamination in the atmosphere, we have convergence, we have all sorts of things that come into play. But even to be able to witness this event on, even if it was one day in a year when the conditions were clear enough, the fact that you can witness that thing on that one day in that year proves the lack, total lack of curvature. So we can have atmospheric contamination, we can have perspective, we can use different optical lenses to see different distances. But if we can make that observation of that thing in that distance that we should not be able to see, then that is conclusive. Yeah, absolutely. And there's counterintelligence for, for everything, you know. For every person who says that 911 was an inside job, there's somebody who says it's ridiculous, we've debunked that already, you know. So it's count. It's, I'm um, sorry, it's point-counterpoint, isn't it, all the way? But to turn around and say Flat Earth has been debunked many times, then you've probably been watching Proof of the Globe, you know? You've probably been, been accepting the information that you've... Basically, you've wanted... You've had a, a, a bias towards, you know? Because if you didn't have a bias towards, you'd, you'd understand the information that's been presented uh, more thoroughly. And I would suggest that you don't, because... The simple spherical trigonometry of a globe states that curvature has to be witnessed. And you say it has been, but it just hasn't been proved. People claim to see the curvature of Earth from the top of a mountain. Well, the official claim is you can't see it unless you're 35,000 feet. However, people have sent high altitude balloons at 116,000 feet, and it's all been um, perfectly flat. So, I mean, these, these talking points can go on and off, on and off, all day long. But the proof of the pudding is in the eating, you know, and it's in the observations. And we, when we can see something in the distance that we shouldn't be able to see, that is the proof and that is the observation. Well, that's kind of like going off into the bushes, but I don't, I don't know how it was difficult. It wasn't rehearsed. It was just off the top of my head. All it means is if there's care, it's just so something should fall beyond it. And you can't quote ships because the distances are too close. You can't really even detect curvature at such close distances. So you have to do it over tens of miles. Once you hit the 50 mile mark, you've got 1,600 feet of curvature that should be at play. And if you see something less than 1,600 feet tall at 50 miles distance, it proves that it hasn't gone beyond the curve. It's not rocket science, Dan. But you did go on to some different subjects, which I found interesting. Let me go back to your queue. That was it. Yeah, it was the sound, wasn't it? And the tree and the lack of noise. Well, sound is vibration and you need something to interpret the vibration into sound. So if there's nothing there to interpret the vibration into sound, there is no sound of a tree falling in a forest if nobody's there. Yeah, but there's no such thing as flat earth science, Dan. It's all globe science. And that's what they're exposing, the globe science, you know. But the, I don't think anybody would argue that everything is vibration, you know, because it is. Your scientists will tell you everything vibrates. The particles of your table are vibrating. The light is, is shimmering. You know, everything is vibration. So sound is also vibration. Sound is translation of vibration because we have ears, you know. So I don't know. It's not a matter of, you can't argue with a flat earth. All flat earthers are doing, and I'm not a flat earther, is presenting this, the ball earth science for analysis. So if you're arguing with a flat earther, you're arguing with your own accepted science. What I'm saying is sound, the audibly detectable sound, is a translation of vibration. I don't think you would argue with that, would you? <laughs> I'm sure the glass didn't just feel it. I mean, how would you know? You might have shattered its feelings. No, but you're forgetting the part that says, if there was nobody there to hear it, does it still make a sound? So we're talking about the absence of people here, or the absence of any creature that can detect or translate vibration into sound. So we're talking empty forest, remember, we're talking empty room. This is all hypothetical, right? Because you don't get an empty forest, you get animals and stuff like that in there. So imagine if it was an empty room, there's nothing in there to register the sound. So you seem to be forgetting that part, Don. Well, basically what you presented is if a tree falls in the forest and there's nobody there to hear it, does it still make a sound? That's, that's the saying, right? But the key component of that is if there's nobody there to hear it. Hey, Ludwig, how's it going? Yeah, it's, and I was just addressing that, that's all. 
but you have to take into consideration the saying says that if there was nobody there to hear it so if there was nobody there to hear it there is no sound to be registered yeah funny <laughs> i wasn't requesting an audience then i was just addressing what you were saying and it's not about an audience is it it's just about one person talking to another and if somebody else is interested then they can talk as well yeah i saw that um i noticed when i was using the newer version of Zello, there was no opportunity to send a text so i'm guessing they've got the setting on administrators only or something which is a little unfair isn't it i was attempting to do that a couple of days ago and the facility wasn't available to me so i'm guessing that it's only set up for admins yeah it's one of those restriction of speech things isn't it um i don't really understand it because in the past it's been quoted that the concern is because the application goes out over tuning well they don't get to see that so i don't know to me it would just be the same principle of moderation if somebody sends something into the room that's inappropriate block them well i happen to think that zello know exactly what they're doing when they introduce these things so i can understand what you said there steve if you prove it then they could still they could still text you know I guess seller are thinking, well, if that's the issue, then it would be time for a balance or a block or something, rather than just, you know, keep people on prohibit. Because the people who create this application also use it, you know. Oh, sorry. I um, don't know how I managed to just steal the button from you once you'd already keyed up, but I've got no experience with the Bluetooth thing, Ludwig, so I can't help. But how did I steal the button when you'd already started talking? Okay. Uh, did you just say you ate pizza every day for the last three days? You must feel like crap. Sure got somebody in the feelings there. Somebody take your ball away. I'd like to come up with some new initials for it. It wouldn't be ISS, it would be something else. But um, let me know when you've got a picture of those planes flying upside down, Max. Uh, put it on the glass. Yeah, well, you should be able to source me a picture of a plane flying upside down at the bottom of a ball from a, a zoom in. Should be able to do that with video, shouldn't he? So you should be on this place in space and then you should be able to zoom in right into the earth and you should be able to zoom into the bottom of the earth and clearly see planes flying upside down. Relativity, eh? That's like gravity, isn't it? That magic formula. But um, seriously, then you do believe that there are people upside down below your feet and planes flying at all angles, including upside down below your feet. Allegedly. Doesn't... Robert Simon, NASA data visualizer, coming out openly admitting that he's stitching ribbons of data together to create the blue marble shots of Earth. Doesn't that bring up a red flag for you, Max? Maybe you did offend them already, calling them Eskimos like that. Bad robot! Stop thinking, Ludwig. We just do, okay? But I believe there are people who believe that the white man came from the Caucasus, Ludwig. Um, I think even the Scientologists believe that, don't they? When they talk about that Zanu character and they say that all the the peoples of the earth are really from different races and they came here to have a war and stuff and some of them were renegades and all of the rest of it. Some people actually believe that. I think you just kind of hit the nail on the head of what science really is at the moment anyway. The word you were looking for there, was it scientism, which is essentially just a belief in the people who we've accepted as scientists, whatever they offer us, that's it, we're believing that, and that's scientism. I like these silences, they're very profound. Newton, the whole gravity thing, this is, see how they manipul manipulate the terminology to anti-gravity, why don't they just call it levity? since gravity has never been proven. It's a false equivalency, isn't it? But they love it. They love those false equivalencies. It's like, oh, the planet's around. It's like, dude, looking at the ground. But anyway. Well, the thing I read about UFOs is that when they activate the electromagnetic fields, they have a tendency to instantly shoot, shoot upwards so it's got nothing to do with counteracting this mystical, magical, invisible force of gravity. It's more to do with um, preventing it from shooting up. 
you know, as opposed to preventing it from falling down. But then again, they tell us everything in reverse, don't they? That's a good case for time travel right there, isn't it? How would he have known? So where does he say he's actually getting this information from? Is it from the dream vista? Is it astral traveling? You know, anything like that? Or does it just go straight into the story and you don't get any more? See, I've had glimpses of events in my personal life that are yet to come in dreams, only in dreams. Um, on one occasion, I had a dream where I went back to the year 1694 and it was like I had my current level of awareness. I knew that I was somewhere else. I actually stopped a person and asked him what year it was because he was dressed very period, nothing like we dress now. And he looked at me very strange and said 1694 and the dream went on to a few other things. But all of my life I've had dreams of future events affecting me personally a little bit on on a, a more wider level. But um, I've been with relatives or friends on many occasions where I've gone to places that in this lifetime I haven't yet visited and I've been able to explain what was around the corner or what's ahead without you know actually having reached that point yet. So I, I speculate that is is getting this information from the dreamscape somehow. How you could get such an amount of information is beyond me. He must have been pouring all of his energies into it. Yeah, definitely sounds like one to read. But the remote viewing thing that you mentioned there, um, I have engaged with that. I used the Learn Remote Viewing DVDs. Um, that was Major Ed Dames's offering. Uh, it's still available. So basically what that is, it's a series of DVDs. It walks you through the process of remote viewing, which is done on paper. Basically, you're recording your sensory impressions that you get. Each page, you're, you're making notes of something different and you work towards producing like a, like a diagram or a drawing from all of the little jots and senses, you know, configurations that you've acquired along the way. So it's not like you, you sense that you're in a place. You just imagine you're, you clear your mind and you're recording the essences of things that you get. You might be tasting things. You might be sensing motion. You might be getting colors. But you have to get all of these things within a four-second period. Otherwise, the creative mind interferes. So imagine you sat there, right, and you, you're getting a colour red and you're getting like um, a dimension of movement and you're getting the smell of smoke. If you have a, a pause longer than four seconds, you have to let go of the pen, pick it up again and then start recording again. But it works. I can testify to the fact that it does work. And anybody who, who hasn't heard of it, I would encourage you to get it. Learn remote viewing by Ed Dames and just go through the whole process and you'll see for yourself if you take it seriously that it actually works. Yeah, didn't he, he used to sleep with the book under his pillar and then he would ab absorb all of the information during the night and he'd be able to speak to everything that is said. The interesting thing about premonitions from what I understand through research, through reading, um, some of the Jane Roberts books and she contacted an entity called Seth and this entity said that the actual act of making a prediction alters the um, probable timeline because apparently we're all on probable timelines and this is one although allegedly it's real and everything it's still probable so this is a probable reality yeah, and he was saying that if you make a prediction on within a, a probable reality, you change the outcome of it. So it can no longer really manifest the way you, you're claiming it's going to. It's very in-depth, very complicated. There's a great mini-series about such a thing. Um, it's called, I think it's 11-22-63 or 22-11-63. I think it was the first one. And it's about this time traveler who was attempting to go back and prevent the assassination of JFK. And um, everything gets in the way. Everything gets in his way. It's really good. I'm not going to spoil it for anyone, but it's well worth the watch.
It's interesting. It's got a great end to it. Oh, sorry, man. I thought you'd finished after the word science. But um, you're right, and it is ridiculous. If, if somebody were just to want to look at that, get a kind of visual representation of what they say is going on, all they have to do is type into Google, Earth following sun gif and then you'll see what they're talking about but again you're right you know imagine if you was in a car and these stars were passing from the front window to the back window you know you would re register the the idea that they had moved but like you say the stars don't move the only things that allegedly do move are the planets which used to be referred to as wandering stars well, just our Earth alone is supposed to be travelling through space at, get the number, 66,600 miles per hour. Well, allegedly the Sun is travelling at 514,000 miles per hour. So what, is it supposed to be pulling all of those stars with it as well? Because, we, like you say, we're seeing the stars appear in the same places. Exactly, and the sun's supposed to be the closest star, right? And that's moving as well. So if we're following the closest star move, all those ones further away, we should register the parallax of those. Would it, though? Would it, though? I mean, this is uh, speculation just to say it would find a balance, isn't it? But there's no proof that any of those so-called planets have any mass whatsoever anyway. All the images are just composite. You know, it's just people saying something, people making a claim. So let's look at the claim and the science that's supposed to be backing it up. The Cavendish experiment, which allegedly proved that a, a greater mass attracted a smaller mass in a barn with two lead balls, never been repeated. Now, why couldn't they repeat that? Why couldn't they show that in the schools, in the colleges and in the universities? I'll tell you why, because gravity is a hoax. Yeah, they swung them around in circular motions and the claim was that the larger lead ball attracted the smaller lead ball, proving that gravity has an effect, but it's never been repeated. Yeah, well, I would say the actual physical law is that everything rests on the surface and it's not until some pressure or some force has been applied that it rises, but then it must come back again to its own equilibrium and... and settle on the surface again to say that there's gravity is to say that there's a force that actually pulls it down well no i would say there was a force that actually pushes it up in the first place yeah, magnetism clearly does exist amongst metal objects um but magnetism isn't pulling us down to the ground is it for a start our bodies are not metal wood isn't metal so yeah magnet is here magnetism is here on the plane well, my question has always been is where does this force begin? Is it supposed to begin at the centre of the Earth? Well, let's first determine that there is a centre of the Earth by proving it's a globe. I would say it's because Earth has been designed that way. You imagine if you were a creator, and we think as humans in terms of things like computer programmes and stuff like that, right? That's how we can easily design environments. That's what we've got to work with. So what has the creator got to work with? How can he, she, it, they, whatever the force is, how could they create an environment? And what rules would they have governing that environment? Just like if we use a computer and we, we create some code that says this code does this and that bit of code will react in a certain way to this bit of code, you know? Is it really hard? to think about the idea that our environment has been created by someone, something, an intelligence that's outside of the environment and thus privy to more information than we are as to how things can be encoded within it. Listen to what Neil deGrasse Tyson says about gravity. He'll say he doesn't know either, he doesn't know how it works or what it is. What is gravity? We have no idea. Okay, next question. <laughs> Wow. No, here's the difference. We can describe gravity. We can say what it does to other things. We can we can measure it, predict with it. But when you start asking, like, what it is, I, I, I don't know. Hold on. I'm, I'm just going to find out for you, Dan. Hold on. I'm just going into a black hole. <laughs> what have you said? If you go into a black hole, uh, the only thing I theorized was that radio signals may act like water and 
find its way through things, through crevices and gaps. I quoted that the dishes are pointing towards the tower and I also quoted that the guy who fitted the dish on the top of my roof admitted to pointing it at the tower. So I wasn't theorizing anything except the way maybe signals travel through the atmosphere around buildings. But in Ludwig's defense, right, so you kind of like just attacked him because of his political views. If I was to do that, then I would say that all of those scientists brought over to America under paperclip, I would say they had no qualifications whatsoever because they were Nazis. And so they couldn't be employed, employed in NASA, you know, they couldn't be employed to make any new innovations or anything like that simply because they were Nazis. But that's not the truth, is it, Dan? So Dan, let me ask you a question then. For do you think that for somebody to specialise in to specialise in a subject, that they must have to do that through the mainstream institutions? Are you suggesting that people can't specialise away from those institutions and come up with proofs or ideas or theories that are valid? To paraphrase something you said earlier on in your key up, Dan, basically you said something to the effect of how can two bums on Zello know better than these great scientists that you revere so, you know, so greatly? Well, I would say two bums on Zello who are more honest are also more valid, you know? These people who that you look up to are blatantly lying to us, you know? So I would say the, the greater qualification is to be truthful. Did you just switch device, Ludwig? <laughs> yep, <laughs> you threw Ludwig under the bus. <laughs> How about, should we allow the governments to create imaginary fictional unlimited currency so that we can have clean, safe water? I'd be all for that. Later, Max. How about Mimsy? Not in my Zionist yard. Uh, no, you didn't cut me off, Ludwig. That must be like what happened to me with you earlier on. No question, I guess. When I have a lag, lag Ludwig, I usually just switch the channel off and back on again. It usually starts it out. <laughs> That's funny. <laughs> Should call this Ask Ludwig. Oh, that was just a test. I thought Zello was glitching out. Do you want to remind us of the book title and the author again, Ludwig? So is the claim being made that he will be the last president? Yeah, I think I'll have to get that. Or maybe listen to it like Ludwig said on YouTube, he said, didn't he? Bit random. What about Telegram? That's supposed to be encrypted and it's quite cool for passing files around as well. You can create rooms, generally the text rooms, but you can also speak you know it does like a recorded message and it goes straight into the room are you sure that was a school Dan are you sure it wasn't a mental institute you went to there um I'm going to be on the side listening because I'm taking my daughter home shortly but interesting science topics this afternoon good stuff talk to you later have a good one an untrue version of the truth